discourse so far has been a prologue. It hasn't really come to the nitty-gritty yet, because it, first it was the historical background of this um, tale, what's happening here, and then we heard about the wrong teaching about karma, and of course also about the right teaching of karma, and then the kind of um, benefits that the spiritual life, the recluse's life can give, but only as a very beginning, namely that one gets a bit of freedom from the ordinary, everyday kind of responsibilities. For instance, one doesn't have to make a tax return, which is a very nice thing. And uh, one doesn't have to balance bank accounts. And one doesn't have to have one's car fixed because one doesn't have one. So it's a, it's, all these things are a great help in the spiritual life because it leaves one time and attention and lack of worry so the mind is freer. It also, there's been some talk about the purification aspect, the purification particularly of our thinking. I've gone into that to some extent, um, quite in detail. And we now come to that part of the Sutta, which is this purification through our conduct. And it is that part of the teaching which is sila, morality, virtue. And in this particular discourse, it is explained in great detail, in far more detail than is usually the case, because it goes into it from more angles to show how what things can be detrimental to our mind. Now, if one sits in meditation and doesn't get concentrated and the mind goes out into the world, this is due to the fact that we've taken in a lot of things from the world. This is a problem. That, of course, is also the reason why one needs a longer retreat so that we can stay away from the world longer so that the mind becomes quietened down. Because the idea that our mind is a certain way is one of our illusions. The mind is a receptacle and it is a responder to the input. That's all it is. So if we make it a receptacle, of the right things, then it doesn't have to respond in the wrong way. And the responses which we get, which is the distracted and discursive thinking, doesn't have, they don't have to happen then. So the last paragraph which we had in the, yesterday, (coughs) I'm going to read it once more because it now is in reference to the next thing that comes. So when a householder or a householder's son, and we would like maybe to add daughter to that, Mm -hmm. they live restrained by the restraint of the Patimokha, which are the fundamental monastic rules, possessed of proper behavior and resort, having taken up the rules of training one trains oneself, seeing danger in the slightest fault. One comes to be endowed with wholesome bodily and verbal action. Livelihood is purified. One is possessed of moral discipline. Now the word discipline is quite important here because purification is totally caught up in self-discipline. There's nobody that can discipline one. Those days are gone. That happened when we were in kindergarten and maybe in, in primary school. But those days are gone. Now we have to do it ourselves. And self-discipline is the only way that we can have this 
purification to the large extent where it then brings about a totally different level. One guards the doors of the sense faculties, is endowed with mindfulness and clear comprehension, and is content. So the Buddha now goes into all these different parts of this paragraph. First, the um, rules of training, and then the livelihood, and then the sense faculties, and then mindfulness and clear comprehension. The last two I have already mentioned, but they're going to be mentioned again even in more detail. Now, the first thing that happens with the um, moral uh, discipline, and it is called moral discipline in this discourse, is that the precepts, the basic precepts are mentioned. But with the basic precepts, there are already some refinements. So I think I'm going to read that out and then talk about it. And how great king is a bhikkhu possessed of moral discipline. Having abandoned the destruction of life, one abstains from the destruction of life. One has laid down the rod and weapon and dwelt conscientious, full of kindness, sympathetic for the welfare of all living beings. This pertains to the moral discipline. The first precept is not to kill living beings. And here we can see right away that the opposite is being enjoined upon the person, namely to be full of love and kindness and have compassion for the welfare of living beings, which is the exact opposite of killing. The destruction of life, and that comes again later, but I'll mention it here now. Yes, it comes in the next section. The destruction of life, the Buddha goes so far as to say that one should not destroy or damage seed and plant life. Plants propagated from roots, stems, joints, buddings, that too pertains to moral discipline. So he has ecology at heart. And that's two and a half thousand years old. He even went so far in the Vinaya, in the rules for monks and nuns, to say that when one urinates out in the open, one should be careful to use a place where there was nothing growing, because it could damage that particular um, plant. So the ecology, which we think we have invented, that we are destroying it, um, it has always been destroyed to a certain extent because of negligence, because of lack of uh, wisdom, and because of lack of understanding that we're harming ourselves if we're harming our environment. We don't have to look any further. Anyone who harms environment, harms him or herself, is so clear and obvious. And yet, while everybody says, yes, sure, it's happening every single day. The reason it's becoming a menace to us and our planet is because we have far greater population now than in those days. They were just as um, lacking in wisdom and lacking in understanding as we are. But there weren't as many of them. So we have to be a little more careful now. In fact, we all have to understand that these rules for behavior are not for monks and nuns. They are for them, but they're for everybody else. Because killing is certainly an action which can only bring disaster, nothing else, no matter what one kills. The main reason it brings disaster is because it breeds hate in one's heart. We don't kill what we love. 
Now, it's either hate or it is total negligence and it is complete disregard of being careful around oneself, the kind of care that one takes. Now, some people are very good at cleaning up their houses and they keep them very nice and clean as they should. The Buddha is all for that. He mentions it. But they have no idea that this planet is our house. This is the house we live in. There won't be any houses if this planet is no good. If there isn't anything left on this planet for us to breathe and to eat, there won't be any houses anymore. So it's useless to clean up the houses and not to think about the planet. Or at least the street that one lives on and the trees that are there. So it is interesting that the Buddha already then had this at heart and he enjoined all his uh, disciples to be careful about that. So the destruction of life includes, of course, all animals and that's life, but everything that has any kind of life in it. And also the more one gets an understanding of the lack of individuality and personality that we have, the more we can understand that we are part of all this. We are no different. And in this particular instance, what I'm just saying, the um, contemplation or the meditation on the four primary elements is very helpful. Now, those of you who've been in the course before have heard this. The others may have. I'll mention them. The four primary elements, earth, fire, water, air, or wind, either way. Now, the earth element is everything that's solid. So it's our, our flesh and our bones, anything that's solid in us. But of course the earth element is anything that's solid outside of us. And fire is the temperature. Now it also has the quality, fire element, has the quality in the human being of destruction and digestion, which is also destruction. Fire element has the quality of destruction outside, as we know when a fire destroys, but in the, in the material aspect of the world, the fire element is that which ages. If we didn't have the fire element, there would be no destruction. This ages us. And then we have the um, water. Now within us we can have saliva, tears, sweat, urine, blood, but primarily it's the binding element. If we put, if we have flour and we put a little bit of water, we get dough. It makes us stick together. If we didn't have almost 80% water in us, I always say that we would probably have all our cells running around separately it would be much easier to realize that there is no individual person there because we would have to decide which of the cells is us, but it would be quite difficult to practice, I would imagine. <laughs> and we'd look funny too. The water element is so important because of the binding that that is the reason why we consist of so much water. But what we actually think we consist of is all earth element, because that's all we can feel all the time. And then there's wind or air, and that's of course the breath, the wind in the body. Now all of these four elements can be found outside of us in nature. And it is a very important insight, meditation, to become aware of one or all four of those elements and relate to that same element outside of us. 
earth element is very simple. We can feel the earth element of our body touching the earth element of the cushion. Two hard things touching each other. No difference. We can feel the earth element in the floor, we can see it in the earth, in the tree, everywhere. So this is a very important insight uh, method, method for insight, gaining insight, to see those four in our corporality. They are only to do with body. They do not refer to mind, those four. But if we can see that in a meditative state, it helps greatly to feel integrated into all that exists. The more we integrate ourselves into all that exists, which includes every body, every person, the less alienated we are, the less threatened we feel, the less fear we have, and the more we will become careful and considerate of others and our environment. The consideration of harmlessness. The word in Sanskrit is ahimsa. It's quite a well-known word, to be harmless. Obviously, we will always have some hurtfulness in us. Our body is heavy and solid, and it goes on the earth and there will be tiny little animals around that we don't even see and they will be hurt but if we can be as harmless as possible and recognize our togetherness we have taken a great step towards recognizing absolute truth and we have taken a great step towards peacefulness within there is nothing and nobody that can hurt us because everything and everybody is exactly the same as we are. There's no distinction and no separation. These are all very interesting words and thoughts. They have to be experienced. That's why inside meditation method on the four elements. The um, the wind element also has movement. When we do walking meditation, we can feel that we are displacing through the movement. We're displacing the air through the movement and wind arises from that. Even though we may not be mindful enough to feel it, we can know it. And of course, there's wind outside, there's movement everywhere. So the elements have a quality and also an action. The Buddha says that in order to live without destroying life, one has to have, one has to be conscientious about it. So we have to remember it. And we have to feel ourselves as part of it all. Because then it's easy. But if we have to think every time, whether we should kill that fly or that mosquito and actually the Buddha said we shouldn't but actually it's bothering us and then there's a spider that's bothering us and then there's uh, uh, an ant heap in the garden and we think, oh, the Buddha said not to kill but it's really a nuisance and if we have to start thinking like that it's a chore, it's a difficulty and then we think, oh, well, maybe we could try something else that's a little easier and doesn't talk about those things but if we are part and parcel of everything, there's nothing to think about. We wouldn't dream of destroying the spider or, or whatever we find there. This is in essence the first precept. And it's in essence the first precept for all lay and uh, monastics. It doesn't change. It is, of course, designed to minimize the hate in us. The second one is having abandoned taking what is not given 
he abstains from taking what is not given, accepting and expecting only what is given. He lives in honesty with a pure mind. This too pertains to the moral discipline. So this goes a little further than not to steal. Obviously that's included, but not to take what is not given and to accept and expect only that which is freely given. When there is an expectation of getting value for services given, there's no purity. There is a wanting or there's a marketplace mentality. One does when one is a merchant. Now in the merchant world, it, it is done like that. But in the spiritual world, if one should do like that, and mind you, it's often done. If it wouldn't be often done, the Buddha wouldn't have said not to do it. You can be quite sure that all these precepts were broken over and over again. And that the Buddha pronounced them because they were being broken. It's actually said that when he first started his Sangha, the first, um, first 65, monks he had. They were all arahants, fully enlightened. And there wasn't a single rule because arahants don't need any rules. And the ordination took place by saying, Ehi bhikkhu, come monk, finish. Today we have an elaborate uh, uh, ritual of pronouncing precepts and all the commitments that one wants to do. But in those days, the first was only Ehi Bhikkhu or Ehi Bhikkhuni, come monk or come nun, it was all. Later on, even in the Buddha's time, the precepts started and they were, um, they, they grew ever more, more and more, because more and more um, things were wrong, went wrong because people that joined were not all arahants anymore. So the expectation of getting value for services given is a marketplace mentality and it changes the whole aspect of the spiritual life. Because if one has that expectation, one also will refrain from giving any more than what one is getting back. In other words, it completely changes the whole attitude and there is not there's also the expectation which is not good but what is the worst of it is that there is an wanting a result and if we want a result you know how detrimental that is to meditation if one sits down and meditates in order to get a result, that spoils the whole meditation. There's no way we can concentrate and want a result at the same time. There's no way we can actually live the spiritual way and give maybe our, share our knowledge and share our experiences and wanting a result from that. It um, spoils the whole giving of it. And it also reduces the giving. And because of the expectation that is put into it, the, the giving of the spiritual uh, teaching is then no longer pure. And this is what's said here. He then lives in honesty with a pure mind. So it has to be completely free, the whole thing, of free from wanting anything in return. And that's the second one. Now, the third one is for lay people not to, to refrain from sexual misconduct, but for certain times lay people can take 
more uh, eight precepts, and then the third one changes to celibacy. When one takes eight precepts or ten, the third one changes from having no sexual misconduct to celibacy. So here it talks about celibacy. Having abandoned in celibacy, no such a word exists, he leads the holy life of celibacy. One dwells aloof and abstains from the practice of sexual intercourse. This too pertains to moral discipline. This is often misunderstood. It's misunderstood to mean that sex is bad, because that also comes from uh, our uh, Western background, where that has first been imbued and then taken out. It's, uh, it's everything is right, everything goes, and now it's slowly coming back together again. But it has no connotation of that sex is bad at all, nothing like that. The, the understanding of celibacy is that, first of all, it reduces greed. It reduces dependency. It brings freedom. It um, reduces emotional upheavals. It brings about a feeling of being able to stand alone one doesn't have to have somebody there. And if one has gone the usual course of life, which probably we all have, we all have experienced the traumas when there have been um, relationships and then they fall apart. It's always a trauma. Because of this, why is it such a trauma? Because of this enormous attachment which comes from that. The enormous attachment because of a, a certain idea that one is giving oneself. Whereas if one were to give oneself completely to the spiritual life with a totality of surrender and devotion, one could never be disappointed. There's no way that the Buddha, the Dhamma, or the Sangha, the enlightened ones, could disappoint one. And one is still free, even though one has surrendered. And this self-surrender is actually one of the great myth about sex because that's exactly what it is not that so much that there is of course pleasure that's understood but there is self-surrender and that's what we're actually looking for self-surrender with the only difficulty that then afterwards we'd like to get ourselves back again but if we were ever to self self surrender and in meditation one has to self-surrender otherwise one can't meditate we will learn from the experience that that is the only the only way to real happiness because the self is public and private enemy number one there is no other it's the one that wants so that surrender that we can have to the spiritual life or the holy life doesn't matter what we call it here it's always called the holy life brings with it right from the start already a feeling of having achieved something even though we may not even meditate yet properly we may not have understood a word of the whole thing but having given oneself it because one isn't hanging back anymore one isn't holding oneself back the more one holds oneself back the more problems one has it's, e it's natural because the bigger the me the bigger the problems I always like to compare that with a very very fat person 
that wants to come through a door like that and maybe is so terribly fat that that person will hit the doorposts on both sides because it's so fat and so it hurts to get through the door or maybe even have to squeeze through the fatter the ego the more we will hit all the doorposts that are around and the more it hurts so the more we self surrender the less it hurts and it can be proven by everyone for him or herself nobody needs to take this on faith all one has to do is try it out having abandoned false speech he abstains from falsehood speaks only the truth lives devoted to truth trustworthy and reliable he does not deceive anyone in the world this too pertains to moral discipline and this is the fourth precept and it's not lying naturally but to live devoted to truth is a little more than not lying and it has as a connotation something else it has as a connotation that one is devoted to finding absolute truth because that is what the buddha's path is all about now obviously it starts out with not lying that's clear there's no doubt about that and we all have been told by our mothers when we were this high that we're not supposed to lie and probably tried it over and over again and thought it wasn't getting us very far so now we may have decided by now that lying is not a very good thing but that includes also those little white lies which are socially so acceptable and it also includes lying to oneself about oneself and that's one of the very popular pastimes often we think we're much worse than we are and we tell ourselves stories about how terrible we are and how we can't do anything and then when we've become depressed enough about that then we tell ourselves how wonderful we actually are and that's just as untrue to see ourselves clearly and be really truthful about ourselves is not easy it is as if we had blinkers on so it's sometimes quite helpful if somebody gives us a hint if we can take it sometimes not so easy so not to lie to others yes no social lies yes but to be honest to oneself about oneself to really try to find out what makes one tick and that's what all the insight methods are all about and i will say this over and over again methods are methods by any name they never are the truth they are only a method and we have dozens of them and you're welcome to as many of them as i can think of and as i might be mentioned and I, I find in the commentaries but they are still only methods they are not insight and they are not calm they are not samatha and they are not vipassana but they can get us there so the path that we can take to be honest to ourselves about ourselves is also the same path that makes us should search for absolute truth now we make a distinction in this terminology between relative truth and absolute truth meditation and the uh, insight path is a science the science of mind and all sciences have their particular terminology and one needs to know it in order to know exactly what one's talking about sciences are also always repeatable they are never just a matter of luck so here we have relative truth now in the relative truth we are all here sitting here like little separate heaps and uh, everybody has come to um, have a nice meditation and get peaceful and maybe gain some insight 
That's the relative truth. Everybody has come for that and has the idea, I'm going to meditate and I'm going to do it right and I'm going to gain insight. That's fine. And in this relative truth, we are male and female, young and old, um, rich and poor, and all the other distinctions that we make between ourselves. Clever and stupid, whatever. And in that relative truth, we have houses and chairs and uh, statues and flowers and all the rest of it. And we are very familiar with it. But in absolute truth, none of that holds true. And absolute truth looks entirely different. So we always have to be sure also from which standpoint we're talking. And from the standpoint of practice, we're always talking from relative truth. Always. There's always me sitting here wanting to meditate. Now, in the teaching itself, absolute truth will be mentioned. But the standpoint of practice is always relative. And I was mentioning that when I was talking about karma. That as long as we think I'm me, we're making karma. So we have to be careful to make good karma. To live devoted to truth, the Buddha said, also includes not to exaggerate and not to underrate. This is also a common thing that we do that because it also is an ego support. Both are ego support, exaggeration and underrating. So we have to watch that too. It also includes to be trustworthy and reliable. See, this is a far more elaborate uh, explanation of the moral precepts than is usually found. The trustworthiness is a person who would abstain from any falsehood, would never say one thing and do another, would always be trustworthy and totally reliable. Now, if we are trustworthy and reliable, we feel good about ourselves. We know that we can rely on ourselves. And because of knowing that, we have already found a certain steadiness within. Not to deceive anyone in the world. It's a tall order, isn't it? Because in order not to deceive anyone, we've got to be able to speak the truth. And one of the things which makes for good friendship, and the Buddha often talked about friendship, how important it is for the spiritual life. One of the things which makes for good friendship is honesty with each other. To be able to be honest to another person about oneself and knowing that that other person is not going to take advantage of that, and also knowing that the other person is going to be equally honest. That is friendship. Then one feels at ease and at home. And to have such friends in life make a great difference. Ananda, the Buddha's cousin, whom I've mentioned before, and his attendant for 25 years, once said to the Buddha, Sir, a good friend is half of the holy life. And the Buddha said, do not say so, Ananda. A good friend is the whole of the holy life. And a good friend in Pali is a Karyana Mitta. And a Karyana Mitta is also the meditation teacher. So, honesty and straightforwardness has to be part of that friendship. Otherwise, there is none. We can all be superficially polite, and we usually are, because it's the only way we can get along out there. But that doesn't help us to see ourselves. As all it does is we get through the day somehow, the best possible way. And of course, one has to do that. But friendship is a totally different matter. And the. Uh, Friendship, that's not the only time friendship is mentioned. There are many other uh, times too which we will also 
I'll see about. A friend is also one who is trustworthy and reliable even when things go completely wrong, when one has great difficulties. They, they, do, they are not fair-weather friends. They stay with one. And they are somebody that one always feels one can relate to about anything that goes on within. So this is um, not to deceive anyone in the world starts with not deceiving oneself. And that is a tall order. Now there's more to this um, false speech. There's a whole list of it. Having abandoned slander, one abstains from slander. Now slander has to be understood rightly too. Slander is saying something about another person which is totally untrue. That's slander. And that, for that, if it's printed, one can be taken to court and there can be enormous fines for that. So, in our case, we are not important enough for that sort of thing. But slander is always untrue. One does not repeat elsewhere what one has heard here in order to divide others from the people here. So not to say something with the intention of dividing friends or acquaintances. Not saying something that one has heard from somebody else so that that person then will be totally against that person that one has supposedly said that nor does one repeat here what one has heard elsewhere in order to divide others. Backbiting, in other words, talking behind the backs of people with that intention of taking, bringing them apart. So one is a reconciler of those who are divided and a promoter of friendship. Rejoicing, delighting, and exulting in concord. Being happy when people are together. One speaks only words that are conducive to concord. So the, the idea is here that it goes further than not lying, then goes further than um, being trustworthy and reliable. It goes to the point where the speech is being used in order to bring maybe enemies together and make them friends again. In other words, one takes that upon oneself, one takes responsibility. Too often people say, oh, I don't want any part of that. That's a very common reaction to that. Why not? Because they're afraid somebody else is going to say something about them. One must never forget that whoever speaks badly, it's their karma. Strictly their karma. So if there are people that one can help to be friends again, one should make that attempt. Having abandoned harsh speech, one abstains from that. One speaks words which are pleasing endearing, going right to the heart, polite, amiable, agreeable, that too pertains to moral discipline. So again, this whole section on speech, and that's not even finished yet, I hope we have enough time in this month to get through the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> But I feel very strongly that every part of it, every bit of it, is extremely important because it gives a whole a, a picture of the teaching. It starts out with the um, justice showing that it is, in a worldly way, very uh, beneficial 
to live a spiritual life because one doesn't have so many duties and responsibilities anymore with all these um, um, marketplace activities and it leads all the way to Nibbana and every bit of it that every step on the way is in there because it's necessary the Buddha wouldn't have put it in there if it wasn't necessary and Nibbana I was going to refrain from the word actually it means freedom total freedom and this total freedom is what everybody really wants and that's what everybody really is looking for even though they mightn't call it Nibbana and they mightn't think of it and it isn't something that we sit down with med- in meditation and say okay I'm going to get freedom now that doesn't work that's an expectation but subconsciously that is what we are looking for the freedom from all the oppressions that we put on ourselves all the pressures that we put on ourselves so every little every step in here is one step along that way so this is still about right speech eh? the right speech which should go to the heart it should be um, something which is um, endearing and helpful having abandoned idle chatter uh, this is a real a real problem with idle chatter that's the one monasteries and nunneries one recites these um, precepts twice a month and at that time monks and nuns are um, supposed to say if they've broken any of them the question is asked is everyone free from this fault or has anybody has this fault and this is a fault that is always there the idle chatter it is uh, something which is done out of uh, lack of mindfulness we lose our mindfulness so easily it's much easier to lose it than to have it isn't it so the and speaking because the Buddha never uh, said that one should be silent totally in this life is one of the things that is done a lot and so of course the idle chatter comes in very easily it's a matter of mindfulness to try to see with clear comprehension what is the purpose of what I have in mind to say is it skillful is it within the Dhamma and and then at the end have I accomplished my purpose not always does one accomplish the purpose with one speech but often yes if one is careful about it idle chatter one speaks at the right time time and speaks what is factual and beneficial now that's part of that um, formula which I have already given you about right speech at the right time what is factual and beneficial that which is factual which is really true to the facts and will help one speaks on the Dhamma and the discipline so here are actually guidelines that one should use Dhamma as much as one knows it for one's conversation conversation about Dhamma does not have to start out the Buddha said because one might not know what he said but it certainly is about something which is elevating to the mind and takes it away from its worldly concern the worldly concerns are constantly bringing the mind into a downward slide and you can notice that in your own meditation when the mind goes into the world it goes down and when it gets away from the world there's an uplift the world hasn't got it it cannot supply it what it is that we're searching for we're searching for fulfillment in the heart we're searching for a complete freedom from oppression and pressure how can the world give it 
It's impossible. If it had it to give, everyone here is old enough to have found it by now. It just isn't there. So, the words are worth treasuring. They are timely, backed by reason, measured, and connected with the good. That is, that too pertains to moral discipline. Now, these are really very um, wide-reaching guidelines that the words are worth treasuring, they're timely. They are done at the right time, they're timely, they belong to that which is going on. They're also backed by reason. And this is interesting because in the last paragraph before that it said the words should go to the heart but they should also be backed by reason. And this is something which is mentioned many times and most often forgotten in the teaching and in the learning. That we have heart and mind. We have feeling, emotion, and we have logical thinking. And we have to use both. If we only go along one, one of them, use only one of them, it is like popping on one foot instead of walking on both. It's tedious, it's uh, painful, and it doesn't have the advancement that we would have if we would walk properly. So here it is about speech, but it pertains to everything we do on the spiritual path, and even in the world. It has to have the reason, the facts, factual. It has to be backed by reason. In other words, it has to be logical. It has to be understandable. We have to understand it. We have to be able to make ourselves understood through speech. But it also has to have the feeling behind it, the warmth of the heart. The two have to go together. And if one is lacking, it's always going to be difficult and non-productive. If we have too much of one, we need to cultivate the other. We can make that assessment ourselves. Very simple. Everybody knows it. And this is a very important aspect of the teaching. And the heart aspect, I've said this before, but I'll repeat it, is the devotion aspect. The devotion, the love, the surrender. It's a heart aspect. And the reason aspect is the understanding, the logic, the working of, on insight to see things differently through analysis all totally necessary but always in conjunction we can also say that the pathway towards calm samatha is the heart aspect because all the factors of the meditative absorptions are connected to feeling and not logical thinking it's impossible to logically think a meditative absorption So that's the heart aspect. And all those insight methods, which I've already mentioned, and probably will mention again, are all connected to the mind aspect. So now we, we finish with the speech. And now this comes separately. One abstains from damaging seed and plant life. Now the damage is something that we will undoubtedly do because we've got to eat. And if we plant our own vegetables and then eat them, we have damaged it. But that has to be done. So we have to sustain life. This damaging goes further. It goes to negligence and willful destruction for no reason whatsoever. 
and willful destruction or maybe out of greed or sometimes yes mostly out of greed and now come more elaborate details of this moral um, discipline one abstains from dancing singing instrumental music and witnessing unsuitable shows and this is usually a point of controversy what we're not supposed to dance and sing the buddha doesn't like us to have any fun huh well instrumental music also witnessing unsuitable shows it probably would mean getting rid of the tv set <laughs> I've never seen so many unsuitable shows advertised as in one of those TV magazines. Um, to dance and to sing and to make music, instrumental music, make music, it takes the mind away from the purification path and puts it on a path of sensual gratification. Now we have plenty of sensual gratification all the time one of them is eating we have to eat we can't live without eating so there's one that happens all the time we can use our we use our eyes automatically to look at nature and it's often very beautiful beautiful flowers lovely sunset we look at beautiful things automatically our eyes go there and we are drawn to it with the mind so we have those things happen to us anyway and we will hear things like the birds singing we can't help that we shouldn't have to help it it's beautiful it's very nice to listen to that we can sit there and we can become quite concentrated near buddha house where i live in germany there's a quite a big waterfall and often people go there from the retreats it's quite near you know like five minute walk and sit down there and the sound of the waterfall gets them very concentrated because it's a very um, repetitive sound and also it's very pleasant a pleasant sound and uh, bird singing can do it too if it's repetitive so we have all these sense contacts without which we couldn't live and they can be extremely pleasant and if we have any um, understanding of that this we would be grateful and enjoy those pleasant contacts so we don't need to go out and search for more some which are much more impactful than those that we get anyway instrumental music dancing and singing which we do if we do it ourselves and these unsuitable shows they have a far greater charge behind them so our senses are far more um, used and it may, it may not be soothing at all. On the contrary, one just think of an evening in the disco. Pretty awful, isn't it? Or is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, if you're under 20, maybe it's all right. I have to admit I've never been inside one, but I have uh, heard it f from the street. <laughs> so it is part of the priority of the spiritual path. If that's one's priority, one does not go out to subject the senses to any more impact and contact than we have anyway because the mind becomes disturbed from that and I like to explain that once more 
can't remember now whether I explained it here or in the last course, but anyway, I'm going to explain it anyway. Um, it's very important to recognize the fact that our senses do not have the reaction that we think they do. It's always the mind. And this is why it is important to abstain from these very strong contacts of the senses because the mind will react very strongly. The ear only can hear sound. It does not hear noise. It does not hear music. It does not hear waterfall. It does not hear trucks. It just hears sound. But the mind knows waterfall, trucks, music, all of that, and reacts to it. Says, I don't like this one. Oh, I like that one. I'll get that one again. That was very nice. So, we are protecting the mind by protecting the senses. And that is also a later instruction then, to guard the sense faculties. We'll get to that even in greater detail. The eye can only see color and shape. It cannot see pretty girl. It cannot see beautiful um, uh, uh, surroundings it only sees the color and the shape and I usually use this as an example everybody here knows without the shadow of a doubt that this is a clock right there's no doubt about it in anybody's mind now if you give this to a two year old he may start biting on it thinking it's chocolate it has the appropriate color for that but he may also start playing around with it thinking it's a toy because it also has the appropriate shape for that. And in his memory, there's no clock. There's chocolate and there are toys. And yet it's exactly the same item. No difference. Now, that happens to us constantly. And what I'd like you to do is to actually experience this. I'm giving you lots of homework to do so that nobody would get bored. I mentioned mindfulness of the body yesterday, of all movement and action. And I've mentioned the four <coughs> primary elements today as a meditative or contemplative practice. And now, another thing. I've already talked about sound. I've already said that because it was important, because there were a lot of sounds. I'll say it again. When there is sound, watch the mind immediately describing it. And then try to slow down with the next sound and see whether you can stop the mind from describing it. And the way to do that is to deliberately stop the mind from doing it, just like in meditation, as you deliberately stop the mind from thinking. Hopefully you do. And stay on the meditation subject. It's a deliberate action of not allowing the mind to play games. Now here, that's in the meditation here, this is not a game. This is the way we always work. But we don't have to. Because because the mind reacts to everything that the senses take in, we are constantly at work with the mind and constantly judging and constantly reacting and constantly on the lookout for that which we like and trying to get rid of that which we don't like. And it is full, the makes a life full of pressure and stress and strain. And it's not 
because we are in a particular situation, it's because we haven't seen what we do to ourselves. I call it the pre-programmed printout. <laughs> so if you can stop this pre-programmed printout just once, you know what it's like. And you can see that it's very peaceful. We don't have to react to everything we see. We don't have to react to everything we hear. Now these are the most, the most impactful, the seeing and the hearing, plus the thinking. We don't have to react to everything we think. But now let's just practice on hearing and seeing. It is the epitome of mindfulness to be able to see something, anything, and not say in the mind, leave. It's not even verbal. It's immediate reaction. The mind doesn't even say leave. It's much too unimportant. It doesn't even verbalize. It knows. Stop that knowing. Just seeing. It's not easy. But it's very, very interesting and enormously beneficial because from that we find out how we actually operate, how we can change that if we want to, and we also get a much clearer insight into who is sitting in there doing all that. Do it with seeing and hearing. The eye only sees shape and color the ear only hears sound. And watch the reaction. What's actually happening is, but it goes so fast, we miss the whole, the whole thing. It makes contact, then comes the feeling, then comes the labeling, and then comes the reaction. We're usually only aware of the reaction. Sometimes, if we are totally uninterested in the object, the object is so neutral that it has not uh, aroused our interest. We are only aware of the labeling. It's very difficult to become aware of the feeling. But seeing we've got all the time in the world and it's very, uh, very um, <coughs> secluded, we can do it. We can look, we can hear, and watch the mind do, it, do its usually, usual program. And because it has this program, which it always follows, we are never really at peace. So we can give it a go and see whether we can change the program and stop it when we want to. Press a button and the whole screen is empty. We also get to know ourselves from a different angle. Hmm. Maybe I should finish this. Huh? Yeah. The next one is, that's uh, the singing huh? and dancing. Then it comes abstaining from wearing garlands, which we usually only do when we go to Hawaii, embellishing oneself with scents, with perfume, and beautifying oneself with unguents. What is this? I don't know what that is. Beautifying oneself with what oils. Huh? You know, rubbing your skin to make it youthful and shiny. Oh. I think it's oils, is it? Unguents, oils. Okay. So not to beautify oneself with, with perfume and with oils and with garlands. In other words, to um, be as one is to be contented with what there is. And it's interesting that this particular um, instruction is also two and a half thousand years old. And people were painting themselves then just as they do now. And of course, very often it is um, considered to be a female thing to 
make one beautify oneself. But um, and it is more obvious, I think, on the with the female of the species. But um, it has never, not always, been confined to that. There have been times in human history when it was the male doing it all, and the females were not doing it. So anyway, the reason for that is also to stay with the way one really is, with the truth of it, to look at oneself and be contented. And not only that, but trying to beautify oneself, of course, supports the ego idea. If there is nobody there, whom am I beautifying? I mean, what is there to beautify? There's nobody there anyway. So there's just a body and a mind. And for what purpose do I want to beautify? For the purpose of having more ego support. Because then people will like me better, maybe. Maybe. So it is an ego support system, and it is also the idea that there's somebody there who ought to be beautified. But on the moral discipline part of it, it, when it is a moral discipline, it isn't yet based on insight. It is based on the fact that one disciplines oneself from too much proliferation, from too many things that are outgoing into the world, but stays within oneself. Staying within oneself, there one can find the truth. The whole of it is within. I think I'll stop here and see if you have any questions. Anything at all? So even classical music is supposedly good music, then one is not supposed to enjoy it? Well, if you're hearing it anyway, you might as well enjoy it. (laughs) (laughs) It's uh, also a matter of being very attached to it, not being able to live without it, There are such people who say they can't live unless they have it. Uh, So that's a very strong attachment and it's very strong dependency. (coughs) If it's happening to be played, if it happens to be there, there's no reason why one can't enjoy it if it's nice. But to go out and try and get it is using one's energy to have sensual gratification. If it happens to be there anyway, that's fine. The Buddha did not say that one has to uh, run away from it, but he said not to search for it. Yes? Um, Along the same lines, and along the lines of great livelihood, um, if one's livelihood is in providing sensual gratification, for instance, being a musician, is that uh, outside of the guidelines? Well, we have, I think, one and a half pages coming up about right livelihood. Hang on a minute, let's see. Oh, yes. Pages and pages of right livelihood here. <laughs> um, well, I, I don't know whether it says anything about music in this particular one, but um, once an actor came to the Buddha and asked him whether that was right livelihood, being an actor, and the Buddha said, no, it's not. And the man wanted to know why, obviously. And the Buddha said, because you are providing an illusion for people who already live in complete illusion. So that was his answer. And um, I don't remember anywhere 
whether he was asked about being a musician, but, and there were musicians, of course. And at funerals they were using them and all that sort of thing. They were there. And uh, at weddings, particularly also. I don't remember that question being asked. I only remember the actor asking. And um, being a musician, providing the sense, sensual gratification, I would assume that the Buddha would have said, no, it's not right. But I don't, rem- I, and I don't know whether that's actually, me- in fact, I do think it's not mentioned here under wrong li- These are all wrong livelihoods that are mentioned here. And it's not mentioned under that, under the wrong livelihoods. There are dozens and dozens of them mentioned, and they're, they're quite interesting, actually. We will read them. And uh, the, uh, the sensual gratification that we get, um, we have already enough of them as a human being in, without having to look for others. This is our escape system, trying to find others. But if one has that livelihood and it is something like that, it could also provide a way of letting the mind become very concentrated. Because you see, painters, whom I know quite a few, can become extremely concentrated when they're painting. I don't happen to know, at the moment I can't think of any uh, musician that plays serious music, but I know these painters and they get very, very concentrated because they have to be. And because of that, they can then do their meditation very well. So hopefully that would happen to musicians. I don't know if one has to be, I I presume one has to be extremely concentrated also to do it right. And then having, using that ability also for the meditation. So it has always has a silver lining. Yes, anything else? All right. I will put the attention on the breath for a few moments. And become aware that your heart carries the seed of enlightenment within. The greatest jewel there is in the universe. Be respectful and devoted and loving towards that seed of enlightenment within you and fill yourself with love being the carrier of this great jewel Put your attention on the person sitting nearest you in this room. Recognize the seed of enlightenment within that person and fill him or her with your love and respect and devotion. Having that great jewel within his heart and mind.
look at everyone here in this room see the seed of enlightenment within everyone's heart and mind love everyone because of that embrace everyone with your devotion towards this greatness that lies in each of us Now think of all the people who are present in this place, each one carrying the seed of enlightenment within heart and mind. Love each one of them, having this wonderful jewel within. Embrace everyone with your devotion. Think of your parents as having that same jewel within their hearts and minds. And love them, respect them, show them your devotion. It's the same greatness and goodness in all of us. think of those people who are nearest and dearest to you carrying the same beauty and goodness within love them embrace them feel the togetherness Think of all those who are your friends, who 
having that same jewel within heart and mind. Give them your love, your friendship, your support. Let them feel it. Think of all those people who are part of your life, neighbors, colleagues at work, salespeople, people you meet here and there, in the shops, on the street, in the offices, all carrying the same seed of enlightenment within. Feel the togetherness. Fill them with your love and devotion. Recognizing the path that we all take towards this realization. Think of anyone whom you find difficult. Where there's any kind of resistance or rejection or fear or worry. And recognize the fact that this person carries exactly the same jewel within heart and mind. Fill him or her with your love, your support and your devotion. Now think of people everywhere, near and far, known or unknown, seen or unseen, all having that same beauty and goodness, slumbering within, waiting to be awakened. Give them your love and support. Realizing that this is all that counts. Visualize as many people as you can. Living around here. In Oakland. In Berkeley, in San Francisco. In the whole state. in the whole country, the whole planet, as far as the strengths 
of your heart can reach. And put your attention back on yourself and feel the brilliance and luster of this jewel warming and filling your heart. Love that. Give it care and support. See that as the most important aspect of yourself worthy of love and devotion. May the seed of enlightenment grow and flourish in people's hearts.